Women who don't ask for raises create good karma for themselves. Those are the types of women I would trust and I would give greater responsibility to. Those words were not spoken in the 50s. Those words were not spoken by some provincial owner of a ma and pa shop. Those words were spoken in 2014 by the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. His views may be more extreme than the average CEO's, but I think they are somewhat emblematic of an inherent bias and uh, prejudices that have been ingrained over centuries. I stumbled over this quote while I was writing my book. Uh, I wrote a book about the financial industry and I explained it with network science. And I looked or I, I focused particularly at people at the top. I looked at it as a human system. And after a while, I realized that I was only writing about men. There were no women, and I had to somehow explain why that is. And it quickly turned out, and I mean, that's a whole other subject, but that it's an effect of network dynamics. And if we don't disrupt these dynamics, these inequalities and uh, imbalances will become more and more ingrained. Women are grossly underrepresented in the highest ranks of the corporate world, despite a clear business case in their favor. This is something also I, I don't have the time to go into now, but there is a wealth of research corroborating and substantiating that diverse environments, and including women, creates better business results. When I wrote the book, and the same year that uh, the quote is from, uh, that was 2014, only 5% of Fortune 500 companies had a female CEO, and now, five years later, it's the exact same number. As a matter of fact, at the time, I was looking how many uh, financial institutions were led by women, and in the US, there was one. That was Abigail Johnson of Fidelity, because her father retired, and one in Europe. That was Anna Botin of Santander, because her father had passed away. So there were two women because of their fathers. <laughs> so there is, are so many reasons why there are few women uh, at the very top echelon of the corporate world, and one of it is of course that women are still the child bearers and they face logistical constraints because research has demonstrated that they are still, even with the most progressive husbands, the primary caregivers and they still bear the brunt of housework. But then there is a more insidious um, issue and that is the, um, the biases and prejudices that still exist. Women are still constrained by ancient social values and perceptions, and masculine behavioral norms do not apply to them. There are endless examples, but for instance, let's take ambition. Ambition is generally viewed as something positive in men, but not in women, because it implies aggression, which is reserved for men. The societal stereotype is still that women should be kind and considerate and caring. Another example is when men talk at length, they're considered as more competent. When women do the same, they are perceived as less competent by both men and women. There is a tendency to expect help from a woman, whereas help from a man is rewarded. Men tend to engage in more visible workplace behaviors or activities, whereas women you know, do the kind of office housework, time-consuming administrative tasks that they don't get any credit for, and so they get less attention for that. Worse, uh, women suffer from poor confidence. Uh, when they're successful, they often feel lucky or worse as imposters. In contrast to men, when they're successful, they usually think it's very well deserved. Um, uh, one reason for that may be, as McK a McKinsey study has shown, that men are judged on performance, what, uh, the other way around. Men are judged on their potential and women on their actual performance. Also, a Harvard study has shown that women are judged more harshly. For instance, if they leave work early, their colleagues, both men and women, assume that she probably has to do something family-related, whereas when men leave early, they think, oh, he probably has a client engagement or something important. Mm -hmm. uh, and that also leads to fewer opportunities for women because if you know, senior people assume that women are constrained by, the, by their families, for instance, travel opportunities are assigned to men. Uh, 
I'll focus a little bit on one specific angle, and that is networks and networking, only because I've done a lot of research um, on that for my book. Um, and I think it's one of the key reasons why women are less visible and less successful in the highest ranks, because they are excluded from the predominantly male networks. Even if women make it to the more senior ranks, in their late 40s, early 50s, they're typically not plugged into the information and power channels to the same extent that men are. You'll see that the higher the rank, I mean, at the entry level, um, it's more diverse, but the higher you get, the more homogeneous the environment becomes, and um, the more it's just male. Um, and so, but if women are not part of these networks, they also miss out on network currencies. Uh, we are all part of networks, we're all nodes in networks, and then there are connections, pathways between those nodes, and that's where we exchange network currencies, such as information is a very important one. It's also capital, what Patricia um, referred to, uh, and just generally opportunities. And if you are not part of this network, you, by definition, miss out on, on these opportunities. Also, because men are entrenched in these structures, that gives them more social capital over the years they can build, you know, doing favors and just hanging out with each other, and that gives them bargaining power and, uh, again, more opportunities. It's kind of ironic because oftentimes women are exactly hired for their social skills, for their EQ, for their ability to form relationships. So they are often hired for, especially in finance, for client servicing, to acquire new clients, but they have not managed to use this skill for their own advantage to advance into the very senior ranks. It's just their very long-standing, almost evolutionary patterns of uh, network behavior that are very hard to break into. Another issue is that male employees tend to have better relationships with their superiors, and part of that reason is that they can more casually hang out with them and network, and it's very important in networking to form informal relationships. It's not just the formal on the record, you know, networking. It's also the hanging out in the office together, the going for drinks after work, and naturally men can do that much more easily with each other, especially if it's a senior man with a junior woman. And in the Me Too age, uh, they may be reluctant to do that. It may create gossip, even if it's very innocent. So women have a, an inherent disadvantage. Also, there are uh, network dynamics like homophily and power loss, like and like attracts. Men just gravitate towards other younger men with whom they, they see themselves in them, they can relate to them, they can short, talk shorthand with them, they can just identify with them. And then male, a purely male senior management has very few incentive to advocates, advocate for, for women. A lot of this discrimination, should be said, is subconscious and unintentional, and I go more into the psychological effects um, and reasons for that in the book. Um, and then also it's uh, women, I write men and at the very senior levels, contrary to what some may expect, have very high levels of EQ. They're very good at relationship building, they're very charming, also with each other. And women, because they always fear that they may be suspected of having advanced on the basis of their feminine charms, become more rigid. And I think that's something that I've observed with myself. You're very prim and proper, you, do, you know, you know. And um, actually, in my book, I wrote an example that, um, and that also goes to the previous point, that at a formal dinner, I was seated next to a bank CEO, who's very well known, shall remain unnamed. And uh, after, when dinner was a little progressed, and he had um, ingested a few glasses of wine, we had talked uh, for a while, he said, gosh, you're so smart, but I could never hire you, or else everybody would think that we'd have a, an affair. And I wrote, I wrote that, and then I, I wrote, I was so embarrassed. And my German editor actually noted that and said, why are you embarrassed? He should be embarrassed. And he thought that was very stereotypical. Then it's argued that um, women lack role models and also that they 
are still learning practices that men have long internalized. That sounds a little condescending. I wasn't sure if I should include that, and everything that I mentioned is substantiated by research. It's not my opinion, but I do have to say we have many qualifications, but what I get approached most about is networking and relationship building, also by people who are already very successful, and I get asked, I feel, surprisingly, basic questions. So I think this is something that's very important, but something that's not taught at business schools or, or any schools for that matter. So what are the solutions? I think ultimately, and that's the hardest because it's intangible, it's immeasurable, is to change the culture and the change biases, prejudices, and the zeitgeist. It can be done. We see with the Me Too movement, behaviors that were still considered normal in the 50s are now completely unacceptable. I think fora and platforms such as these can be very helpful, are very helpful, as the a platform to launch initiatives. And I think it's um, imperative to include women in leadership positions because it has been shown if they're included in leadership positions, they will promote other women, more women. How do you do that? I used to be against quotas. In my home country, in Germany, we didn't have quotas, and this has been a long standing discussion. And what has happened over the last few years? Pretty much nothing. If we look at Scandinavia, quotas have been very helpful. I mean, they can be abolished when there's more of a level playing field, but I think to jumpstart and um, disrupt these network dynamics that create these uh, basically a skewed system, these imbalances, I think it's, it's necessary. And then the aforementioned um, incentives like investor pressure, shareholder pressure, pressure from the board can be helpful in my own professional environment. I hear more in the context of sustainable investing, which has become very fashionable and a marketing tool. And uh, that also includes diversity and hiring more women. I think the media does um, a very important, invaluable job bringing many of these um, things to the forefront, also highlighting, for instance, lawsuits, and we've seen in big banks, I mean, there have been some big ones, um, Recently, they usually get quelched with a lot of money because it's better to pay women off than for details to come to the surface. And I think societal pressure, naming and shaming, as I said, the, the zeitgeist has to change. And I think we need to continuously educate and train everybody, not just um, managers in companies. And just coincidentally, or maybe not so much, uh, Microsoft has been in the headlines again because there was one woman who, on an um, inter-company email system, posed her frustration and said, you know, I've been in this job for six years and I've not made any headway and I feel totally stuck. What should I do? And 600 women within Microsoft responded to that. And then, of course, it eventually leaked to the press and then Satya, Di Satya Nadella, who I mentioned in the beginning, had to come to address this, this issue. So I think that there is still is a lot that needs to be done, but like I said before, we're all nodes in this network and we all need to try and exert pressure and change the zeitgeist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both very, very much for those very interesting, provocative and, and frank comments. Um, you know, Patricia, you did not have much chance to speak to what you think the solutions are. And I think Sandra has outlined quite a few very important points of intervention and approaches. I wonder if you'd like to share a few thoughts also. Yeah, it was, it was uh, I would like to make two points, and then you're right, I did not make many solutions. The first one is the one that I, found, I, I said in my final remarks, which is access to finance. Um, since access to finance is one of the most key drivers in order to go for, lead, for leadership in business, probably some public policy type of access to finance to startups like is happening in Mexico and many other countries could, could, could provide a more level playing field for women. And the other one is education that you mentioned. Um, I have noticed in my investments and around the, 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 the entrepreneurial world in Mexico, that women, we don't believe our own, our own achievements. Um, Self-confidence is important. Um, 
and it, there is a correlation between uh, between how how secure how sure you are that you are going to succeed vis-a-vis uh, -vis as a woman that you jump into into entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is definitely one solution for the problems that we have in Mexico, like for example, in terms of uh, employment generation. But if, if women do not believe that they can do it, and that has to be started from, from the educational level, they will not do it. They, they think they don't deserve it. It's something educationally um, um, oriented. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, respond to that? And that goes to the point as to how little progress we've actually made in terms of access to finance, where an area where the, let net, where the lack of network or access to networks is particularly pronounced is in venture capital. And that's very discouraging because that's a very young industry. So those are younger guys who've grown up with mothers and sisters who've been professionals and their discrimination is abound. And their networks are particularly important. And with regard to education, because I'm working on my next book, and that is based on the changing nature of work. And when we look at digitization, it's a bit scary because I don't see a Robogeddon scenario, but a lot of the jobs that will be lost are jobs that are held by women. And then in terms of digitization, they're going to be incorporated digital biases that also work against women. So I don't think this is a fight that can be won. This is a continuous fight. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 um, I have served on a number of corporate boards and at the board level uh, found uh, that in the boardroom uh, there's really, uh, you know, some serious conversations around, uh, around the advancement of women and attention to how many women are in the system, what are the obstacles, and um, I'm coming to increasingly feel, as you do, that there's, uh, it's, you know, women who step out of the workforce because of children and so forth, it really doesn't explain the situation because they keep working. They just don't stay in many of the settings uh, that they start with because of this mentoring um, dimension. Now, there have been different interventions around this. I remember Indra Nui saying, you know, that the women at Pepsi were having difficulty getting the kind of global corporate um, on the ground management experience uh, that men were, because they were less mobile. You know, it was harder for them because they had other responsibilities. So she was creating short-term responsibilities in, you know, around the world. So a woman could demonstrate her management capabilities with you know, three months here or six months here instead of two years here and so on. They could accommodate um, you know, different life responsibilities. So there are corporate strategies that could be developed, I guess is I'm trying to illustrate, um, you know, to give women the, the kind of visibility around leadership as they ascend to deal with some of these issues. Have you thought of the kinds of interventions that could make a difference? Are you seeing experimentation of the sort that I just mentioned by Indra Nui, or do you feel like these are corner cases, these rarely are occurring? No, I... Th I th Start with you. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say um, solutions aren't, they aren't immediately obvious because they're not simple. You, will have, you see hi hierarchies that have built over time and that become very encrusted and inflexible. So I think proactive, inventive, imaginative measures, such as those suggested by Indra Nuri, um, are important. And I think it's also important for men to champion women's causes, not just women. I think women are more naturally inclined, but I think here we come to transparency and naming and shaming, and, but also on the other hand, assigning credit to, women, uh, to men who champion women's causes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> it was mentioned here the, 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 the issue of quotas and uh, corporate strategies to include women, and sometimes I feel very, very uncomfortable with this because I would like to know that I was invited to a board or I was invited to a position because of my achievements and my knowledge, not because I'm a woman. I was recently invited to a board um, at an international level and said, because we need more women for our quotas, and I had to say no. Um, I think that uh, the idea that was presented in the first presentation in terms of uh, women being mentored by women, 
in the, in in the, in probably uh, at, at a social media scale and stuff like that. It's an avenue that I would like to explore more, and you also mentioned it, because we know that women uh, are very good at mentoring, and mentoring other women is very inspirational. Um, and it's very effective, I have, I have noticed. Um, so probably if we tend more, if, if those who, like myself or yourself, have achieved uh, um, through struggling and stuff, um, some more visible positions in order to be able to inspire others and share our experiences, that could be a very nice avenue to, to keep going in terms, rather than uh, trying to fight for, an, for corporates to, to have policies more oriented towards women in higher positions. Mm -hmm. Could I just say that if I were offered a board seat because the company needed women, I would totally accept it if I were qualified <laughs> for it because there's so many instances where I missed out on an opportunity that I think it's perfectly fine. And then also I think we need to get to the level where we have a more level playing field. If we look at the company of uh, Volkswagen, the German car maker, um, which is you know, there's a big scandal around diesel and fraud and deception on a scale that is unprecedented and Germans didn't think was possible. Um, managers in this company said there was a culture of fear. They didn't dare speak up. It was like, um, like an autocracy. And if I imagine myself on a board that consists primarily of men with this tone, this tone which is quite common in the financial world, I have myself observed, um, you know, this very testosterone-driven, aggressive <laughs> kind of uh, tone. Um, I think it's hard for women, and that's why a lot, many of them decide to leave that world. Well, thank you very much. I think these are very interesting, uh, provocative, in a way, comments. Um, I wonder if I could ask you both a, a, a hard question that I'm grappling with. I mean, on the one hand, I think this Me Too movement has been fantastic to reveal the depth of issues and how widespread and the importance of addressing them. On the other, I sometimes worry that it creates um, uh, more tensions uh, 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 in, in the workplace um, that make certain kinds of interactions that we must make natural, you know, less natural. So. Uh, but on balance, I think it's a good thing. But I wonder if each of you have a view about how it's affected in the workplace. I had a very, um, a very beautiful talk yesterday with a, with a, another woman, and she was saying to me that uh, we went far too, far too, to, to, to the to the opposite direction that we really wanted to be that we exaggerated all these Me Too things in terms of uh, being more like scary uh, to men and uh, that we need to correct now. I mean, probably, probably uh, it's a good, uh, it is a good uh, um, opportunity to think uh, how to use our feminine parts in the, in the work arena relative, rather than being too aggressive, too defensive, too, offense, too offended. Um, I have found that uh, in my early or in my career, to try to become to behave like a woman, like a man, using the suits and power suits and be very aggressive, was frightening to, to, to the to the male world, and it was even an impediment to to advance in my career because I was not listened. I was feared by them, and uh, embracing my femininity and my feminine traits as as a, a carer. Uh, more team maker, open, open more possibilities for me rather than being defensive and seeing I was offended by this, why I was offended by that. There is a keynote speaker today that I have the opportunity and, 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 and luck to be very close to, which is Ifigenia uh, Martinez from Mexico. She's a senator three times. Her career is impressive. And she and I share the same thing. I have never been subject to type of harassment from men in my career, uh, never. Not even like, a look, it, it, and, and, and Ifigenia says exactly the same, uh, shares with me that, that view, like to really say, me too. I mean, I will never be able to say something like that. Probably I'm an exception, but probably also our fellow women would like to get noticed by me too, that is becoming extremely, 
extremely dangerous, I think, for, um, for women themselves. Well, I think it has been good for woman, women and it has been bad for women at the same time. Uh, I actually have a subchapter in my book, the, uh, specifically focused on the financial industry, which I know best. Um, sexual harassment has been outrageous. The Financial Times and others have done surveys, and 50% of women reported to have been subjected to some sort of harassment at some point in their careers. So I think this is just one area also where we need to change the zeitgeist. This is not acceptable anymore. Um, on the other hand, of course, it makes men more reluctant to get into trouble, and, and even women. No, but this is a fundamental problem that it's just in the nature of men and women working together. There's no perfect solution. Yes, that's right. So I think we have a few minutes for some questions, if you don't mind, from, uh, sure. and comments from our audience. And we have a microphone here. So may I invite uh, the first, please, to come up. And if you would tell us who you are, too. Is it working? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Lara, and I'm a Columbia SIPA graduate now in May. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. I'm German as well, actually. And um, I thought um, your presentation was very insightful, and I've worked in consulting before, so maybe just two comments from a young woman's perspective, and I can just say amen to all that. I've literally experienced everything of, like, fearing to be ambitious, of, like, wondering if I should cut my hair, what I should wear, how I should be feminine. So it's a very emotional topic for, I think, every one of us here. Um, also to the naming and shaming, I've had the exact same experience where talking to my boss, he's male, and where he actually said that he's just becoming more and more uncomfortable hanging out or talking to me because um, of all that, um, of all that talk. So just, um, yeah, from a young woman's perspective. And then maybe a question also, because you talk a lot about mentorship. I think there are a lot of students here too, and we're getting into this whole networking area. What are the three key recommendations for a young woman being successful now in entering the whole networking arena? Hmm. Well, mm -hmm. as I said before, I think that uh, the most important part is that believe that you are a very capable individual in the work arena. I mean, for some reason, probably it's a family uh, way they raise us is uh, that we don't deserve as much. And, uh, for me, it has been a very difficult part to, 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 to cross, uh, to really believe it. And uh, probably to have self-confidence is one of the things that I really would like to, to, to mentor on you. I think that women should embrace a holistic networking attitude. And then also research has shown that women are more reluctant to use relationships opportunistically for professional purposes. And I think that's something we just have to get over. Regarding mentorship, I think mentorship is overrated. That's a total luxury to have had a mentor. Um, this is not something we can rely on. Work is getting more short term. There's greater turnover. We see everything is going towards outsourcing. Google has already outsourced 50% of its jobs. So managers are in their positions for shorter amounts of time so they have less incentive to mentor young people when they're going, going to move jobs anyway. So this is something, I think it should be your own mentor. There are so many sources that we can educate ourselves from and just get out of your comfort zone and keep pushing yourself. And people think I'm so great at networking. I'm, an, um, I, I don't, I'm not good at it. I have to push myself all the time too. Thank you very much. You. I, just, I just would like to make just one addition to make it a little bit more difficult for, the, for you to take decisions on that. Um, for me, the reason why I have been able to succeed is mentorship. Uh, probably there is, a, there is a very early relationship between girls and their parents that really uh, can lead to some power of mentors uh, in my life that have led me to understand how they think as males and therefore to be more confident in their world. Uh, one of them being here in front of me, uh, Ned, uh, has been my mentor for so many years here at the Columbia University. He doesn't even remember that, but for me it was like how he behaved, how he mentored me, it has been key for my development. 
Just to be sure, I'm totally in favor of mentorship, but I think it's a luxury if you can get it hands-on, no, but not. you can't rely on it. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. We have another question or Hi, comment. Hi, uh, Raquel Fernandez. I'm a professor of economics at NYU, and I'm, I'll be on the next panel, but I wanted to be greedy and ask a question while I'm here. So I think women are of all types. I don't think that there is a definition of being feminine or not feminine. But I do think that there are pretty well accepted definitions of being egocentric or being uh, arrogant. How do we succeed, uh, this is a question to both of you, without actually becoming what we dislike? I don't love over self-confident men. I really don't like arrogant men. Uh, that's not what I want to see in, say, my female professors, you know, who are my colleagues. How do we, how do we manage that and yet at the same time succeed? Well, I don't think it's a solution for women to become like men because, like I said in the beginning, qualities that are admired in men are loathed in women. So to try and become one of the boys rarely helps, I think. And then in terms of how should we network, how should we project ourselves, I think it very much depends on the environment. Is it a more progressive, creative field? Is it a more conservative field? It depends. And so I think for women, there are less there are fewer boilerplate uh, answers than there are for men. Um, we have to see on an individual basis, and it's a trial and error. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said before, um, just the same way I, had, I tried to be understood by the male world in, uh, in my gender traits as being more motherly, uh, whatever, uh, I. What works for me is basically to try to understand also their gender points of view and uh, just not take them too seriously in terms of th things that I dislike. Uh, to, to be more emphat empathic, I mean, to be a man, to be a male in the, in the corporate world is also very, very scary. And sometimes the attitudes of, of self-reliance and aggressiveness is basically also to try to, to be secure of what, what, where you're standing and to be empathic on that particular aspect probably has worked for me. Well, let me say, we have two, two other people. I'd like to hear from them. My own observation is that uh, 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 humility and leadership uh, are rare combinations, uh, uh, particularly in, uh, I think, in, in US business culture. Uh, but they always stand out as being remarkable when they reveal themselves, I think. Um, and so to me, it's something to applaud when we see people of great accomplishment and a degree of, of humility. May I invite these two last questions and then let you both comment, please. Sure, my name is uh, Negar Bai. I'm with the Baha'is of the United States. Um, and I actually had a related follow-up question which you've actually uh, signaled to in your comments which is, you've spoken a little about the individual path, um, sort of uh, individual traits that lead to success. Uh, and so the question that was asked about how do these other qualities or values come to be central, my question is more structural or systemic. And whether the inclusion, if it just becomes women represented, women in effect being plugged into the existing system is adequate enough. Is there any vision or understanding of how women's greater participation could transform the culture and the business so that different values like humility, like collaboration, like concern for others, um, limiting extraction becomes possible? Do you see that happening at all, transformation um, beyond sort of individual success and representation? Mm -hmm. So question really about women's participation and how that is increasing or not and affecting, if you will, the climate in different ways. I think there was one other person to just collect. Hi, my name is Dawn. I actually work in inclusion. You both mentioned that you actually do support mentorship to varying degrees. I personally don't have a mentor but firmly believe in it. I'm wondering if you can each state three things that you value about mentorship. Well, we have one person who is valued but not uh, put too much weight on it, another one who has emphasized, but let yeah. me give you each a I, uh, you. 30 seconds to answer each 30 of these seconds. comments. Okay. I'm just De gonna definitely, definitely the idea of, uh, of women becoming more represented in the, uh, in the entrepreneurship arena and in the labor market will 
balance the deep between the traits that need, are needed for leadership, definitely. As I told you before, uh, I, I believe that the fact that women are participating in, in, a, in the slow growth industries or, or is because they like to mentor, they like to mother, they like to be more embarking, more embracing, and therefore these type of values are going to definitely balance the values for society in general. And in terms of mentorship, um, it's basically the idea of the original thing that you see to, 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 to like your father, at least that was my case, and to like somebody else that you, are, you, you allow yourself to be led in values that in my case have been all masculine and, uh, and made me understand better how men feel uh, comfortable in an, on an equalizing basis working with me. That's, what, that's the most valuable part in mentorship that I have uh, found. Thank you. Uh, okay, with regard to the three things, the mentorship, I would think ideally a mentor, especially if you're at a younger age, sees things in you that you may not even be aware of okay. and helps you realize your potential. And I think second and thirdly, it's very important that a, a mentor can create access for you, can provide access that you otherwise wouldn't have had to people, to information, to opportunities. Um, with regard to the first question and women's participation and a vision, I think that um, we're seeing two big trends still, globalization and technology, and that creates more opportunities for women at an entry level. Like billions of people are coming, continue to come online, and we're seeing, um, the Young spoke about it in the beginning, we see do-it-yourself globalization on platforms like Alibaba, so that's all very encouraging. On the other hand, network dynamics like the superstar economy uh, lead to self-perpetuating uh, homogeneity at the top, so that's a trend that goes against women, so that's why I said this is a fight that cannot be one that we need to continue to fight every day. I would just add to that a sense that mentors should be, be very frank to their mentees about uh, improvement areas. You know, that's, that's how women succeed, when they can correct their areas of weakness and show their excellence. So let's not forget candor as yeah. we, uh, and uh, uh, tough talk. Well, I hope we've started the morning well for all of you. I know I'm grateful to our distinguished guests. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you.